Hi everyone, welcome to the chapter 2 tutorial for practical object-oriented design in Ruby. This chapter is called Designing Classes with a Single Responsibility and it's covered very early on in the book. This, this principle is covered early on because it's a very very important cornerstone of making good programs. So let's jump right in. So take a take a second and think of a very a very zoomed out view from 30,000 feet um, idea for a program. And so you have this this program you want to make a company that does makes cupcakes or has pants run over to you when you push a button, whatever. You have this idea but you don't know where to get started. And, and getting started really is often the hardest part. In addition to that, you have to keep in mind that how you define classes will impact your program pretty much forever. It's it's you're setting up the basic functionality and that's gonna that's informing how the program will run for its whole life. And you have a hard time at this stage because you don't know what your future needs are and because of that you you can't realistically get it right the first time. So analysis paralysis sets in and you just never start typing anything. Well wait, Sandy says, the, the, you know, given all that is definitely true, the best thing you can do right now is to have some self-awareness of that fact and write code that works now for one thing and then for another thing that can be easily changed later when the time comes. And so as time goes on and as you see your needs change and as features need to be added you you'll have code that's conducive to to adapting and so the main takeaway from this is just have the humility right now before you even start to realize that you're not going to get it right the first time and that that's okay and you can build in future proofness into your code from the beginning so if you're following along in the book, you can see here on page 18 a picture of a bicycle. And this Sandy uses a bicycle, which is a great example, because they're very mechanical devices and all the pieces are kind of out there in the open. We're familiar with this from everyday life. It's uh so it's it's a good it's a good place to start. And so the the first function that we look at is how to find the the gear ratio and that is the ratio of spokes on the chain ring to spokes on the cog and so if you look up here on this right side we have an uh, we have a, a variable called chain ring set to 52 cog set to 11 and then ratio which is an equation chain ring divided by cog dot to float and then the final line just puts out the result of calling that equation. So let's see what that looks like. And you can see here it's 4.72 repeating. And basically what that means is for every time you pedal, the chain ring goes around once and the back wheel spins 4.72 times. And that's great, that's very straightforward. Um, I hope that makes sense. And so what if we wanted to take that and not have to redefine chain ring and cog each time? The way we would go about doing that is by putting in a gear. And you can see this example on page 19. You have, th this is how a, a class is set up and it has a couple different parts. So the first line within the boundaries of the definition for the class is often an attribute reader or an attribute accessor. Um, in this case it's attribute reader and they are chain ring and cog and we'll look a little bit later at what that what attribute reader means but just take my word for it now that that goes there. And the first method within a uh, class is the initialize and if any parameters are taken when you initialize 
an instance of a class, this is where they get transformed into what they'll be later on in the rest of the function. So you'll see down here, gear.new takes these two parameters. One is the chain ring, one is the cog. And here it's saying this, this at sign in front of chain ring and the at sign in front of cog denotes that they are instance variables. And an instance variable just means for this particular gear, the chain ring and the cog have values of 52 and 20. But perhaps in future instances of gear, it could be something else. It could be whatever you set it to be. And then finally, the ratio method, which is what gets called right here. All that does is it says return to the sender of the command, which is here. Return to the sender the result of chain ring divided by cog.2f. And so if we run this one, we'll see that we get a slightly different answer than the last one, but that's only because we uh, made the cog have, have, different, have a different number of spokes. Now before we go too much further, because as you can see the example from page 20 starts to go a little crazy, I just want to ask the question of like, what is a class in sort of a, from a philosophical standpoint? It's, we know it's an object and that it's the cornerstone of object-oriented programming uh, for Ruby, but, but like, what does that, what does that mean? So as, as an object, a, a class is a template for behavior and attributes. It holds states and behaviors, and it's a conduit for messages that transform data. And if a lot of that doesn't make sense, just like think about that or keep those, keep those things in mind. Um, template for behavior and attributes. Keep, keep stuff like that in mind as we're going through um, the next example and going forward, and you'll kind of start to get an idea of what all those, what all those things mean. So here's the example from page 20 and now all of a sudden we're doing, we're doing a little bit more. We're taking um, two more parameters than we were before, rim and tire, and these parameters are getting set as the instance variables, chain ring, cog, rim, and tire. And then for the equations ratio and gear inches, we can get well, we can call those methods and get the results here, like so. So before we get too deep into it, I want to take a look at the example on page 25, which kind of highlights the value of the attribute reader. Um, and you see that on, on line two here. So the question is like, what is, what is this notation? What's happening with that? And basically what it is, is when you put chain ring and cog, when you make those attributes that can be read, basically what you're doing is you're, you're implicitly writing um, this code right here. You're doing it for cog and then the same thing for chain ring. And what that, what this, what these three lines of code are saying is like making, it makes a method with the name of cog and if you call cog, that method will return the value of this instance variable cog up here. And, and that's really helpful because that means that you can reference instance variables like this outside of the class itself um, in the same way that we have, that we're calling the ratio method here. You could also do dot chain ring and that value would come out. That is not only helpful so that you can reference individual values, but it's also helpful because, and, and I said future proofing, because if for some reason your math changed in the future and you needed cog to be, you know, this param cog times two or some other, you had to for some reason redefine what the instance variable at cog is, you would not have to go to the rest of your program and look for every instance 
of at cog and change it to cog times 2, the reference to the value would remain dot cog. So it's it's uh, sort of it's it's sort of a really nuanced kind of concept to get a to get a handle on, but it's very important. And if I could like sum it up in one sentence, it would be having an attribute reader for an instance variable means calling the results of a method versus calling the value of the instance variable itself.